Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to night three of the annual conference of the Center for French Colonial Studies on Zoom. I'm Will Thompson, Vice President of the Center and coordinator of this year's conference. Uh, we've already had two great presentations these past two nights with equally great audiences and questions, and I'm very much looking forward to what else we have in store. Uh, I'll remind you that after tonight, our next two presentations uh, will be uh, on Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m. Central Time. I will send everybody registered for the conference an email with the Zoom link on Saturday morning. Maybe not as early on Saturday morning as the last few days, but uh, you will definitely get an email on Saturday beforehand with the Zoom link. There will be just one link since the presentations will be consecutive. Uh, Mark Wozinski will be presenting at two o'clock and then Carl Eckbert at approximately three o'clock. So you may, uh, if you are not able to join right at uh, two o'clock, you may want to join early for Carl's talk, uh, but we'll aim to have him starting right at three, more or less. Uh, our format again tonight is to have our speaker present for approximately 45 to 50 minutes and then take questions at the end. Uh, we certainly welcome any questions or comments that you may have. Uh, please use the chat feature. Uh, so when you, you're hearing something that Randa has to say and you've got a question about it, uh, you can go ahead and enter it uh, right then and there. And I'll keep track of these and share them with our presenter at the end of her talk. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Randa Duvik, who is not only a good colleague of mine, but a good friend. She's senior research professor at Valparaiso University in Indiana, newly retired from her position as professor of French. Beyond publishing and speaking on 19th century French literature and the pedagogy of French, she has made multiple presentations on Joseph Bailly and his world to groups interested in the history of Indiana and Michigan. She was named Chevalier dans l'Autre des Pons Académiques by the French government for her contribution to French culture and received a national teaching award from the American Association of Teachers of French. Her topic tonight is Peigne d'Ivoire and Pécan, Two Years in the Fur Trade Business of Joseph Bailly de Messin of Michelin Mackinac. Randa. Thanks so much, Will, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, thanks also to our two previous speakers, um, talks that I really, really enjoyed, and I think you'll, you'll see some echoes um, between what some of the things that they said and some of the things that I will be talking about tonight. Um, as Will said, I am speaking to you this evening from Valparaiso, Indiana. We are very close to the southern tip of Lake Michigan, uh, close to Chicago, northwest Indiana. And I need to say that this territory was formerly and still is the home of the Potawatomi people. This evening, um, I want to dive a bit into the business of the fur trade and a little bit into the history of my particular region. Um, the person that I will be talking about, you will have understood, is Joseph Bailly de Messin, uh, otherwise known as Joseph Bailey around here. He was an independent fur trader based for most of his career in Michilimackinac. Um, and just a couple of words about the title of the talk. Some of you, many of you probably will have been able to decipher those terms, Peigne d'Ivoire and Pécan, uh, at least peculiar spelling a little bit. Perhaps that's Joseph Bailey's spelling in his account books, uh, meaning ivory combs part of the uh, trade goods, of course, that he traded with the natives. And Pécan, uh, one of the furs that he received uh, in exchange for those goods, uh, the Pécan is the fisher. And um, I will be speaking about Joseph Bailey, who was born near Montreal in 1774. He and his family moved to the new state of Indiana, uh, just south of Lake Michigan, uh, near here in about 1822. He purchased land here. He continued his fur trade along with some other ventures, living here until his death in 1835. So let's see if I can get this to move on. All right, there we go. There's always the question as to which one of the commands the computer will actually respond to. So it's, it's that one. Um, 
Let me back up and tell you a little bit about my connection to Bailey and his fur trade business and then what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, you may be aware that Joseph Bailey's Northwest Indiana home, the Bailey Homestead as it's known, is part of the Indiana Dunes National Park. You can visit what is today a clearing next to the Little Calumet River, which has around its periphery reconstructed log buildings like the one you see on the left, which are very much like those that he had on his property uh, when he was conducting his fur trade there. You can also see the main house, which you see in the photo on the right, which was uh, constructed shortly after his death on the framework of his main residence, which was a cabin. He did not see this particular house. It was built shortly after his death. Um, as you might guess, Bailly, who was born in Quebec, was a French speaker. Um, his business records were all kept in French. And in fact, he never appears to have spoken English very well by his own telling. The majority of those records, which amount to around 48 volumes of mostly account books of various kinds, are in the Indiana State Library in Indianapolis. But one volume is held by the Porter County Museum right here in Valparaiso, a small museum. Um, it's that volume that I have examined in some detail, and that's really the springboard for what I want to talk about this evening. And here a little shout out to um, my, my colleagues and friends at that museum who have been very, very helpful and accommodating to me. A couple more photos from the Bailey Homestead. This is a part of the Little Calumet River. It really is little, particularly these days, but it does flow into Lake Michigan. And then as you can see, uh, the uh, homestead is registered as a National Historic Landmark. What I'd like to do today is to see what we're able to discover about Bailey and his world from clues gained from within that single document, the one uh, book that I, uh, that I have worked with uh, that's uh, owned by the Porter County Museum. Um, as you will see as we get into it, it is not a personal journal, it is not an account of his life, it is an account book. But we can start with pieces of information in this day book, as I think is the accounting term called a journal in French. We have names of people and places, items that were bought and sold, numbers, um, currency. And then we can fill in uh, with information that we can find in other volumes of Bailey's records. And we can start then to see what his work was like and what the context was like within, he, within which he was working. So brief outline of what I'll be talking about. Who was he? What sources tell us about his fur trade business? What did he buy and sell? What did he trade? With whom did he trade? And then a couple of stories, really, some opportunities and challenges presented uh, as an independent trader, working with employees and developing partnerships with two people in particular. So who was Joseph Bailey? He is not unknown to those who study the history of the fur trade. As I said, born in 1774 in Varennes, just south of Montreal. His parents, um, Michel Bailly de Messin and Geneviève Aubert de Gaspé, were fairly well placed in Montreal society. And he, in fact, he had an uncle who became a, a coadjutor bishop of Montreal, so fairly well placed within the church as well. Uh, Bailey's account books begin the story of his business based at Michel and Mackinac in 1796. The very first volume in this one is owned by uh, the Indiana State Library starts in 1796. And that's obviously when his uh, vast number of business records begin. In his personal life, we know that Bailey was first married to Angelique McGulpin. She was the daughter of a British trader, Patrick McGulpin, quite well known in Mackinac, and um, an Odawa mother. Her mother was Odawa. Um, Bailey and Angelique had several children, including uh, Alexis Bailey, who went on to be a prominent trader and settler in Minnesota. Uh, they separated, uh, and Bailey married a second time, again to a woman of mixed background. Um, her name was Marie Lefebvre, and she was also of Odawa heritage on her mother's side. Um, and in the middle here, between those two uh, marriage relationships, I have sandwiched Forms' partnership with Dominique Rousseau in 1801, approximately. Um, it's not because this was a major life event, it, but it's something that I'm going to be talking about later. And I uh, just wanted you to kind of see where that fits in the, uh, in the timeline. Um, it's, so it's with Marie and her two children and then their children together that he and the family settled in the newly formed state of Indiana, acquiring formal title to that land in the 1830s. 
As I said, the Bailey Homestead is located on the Little Calumet River. It's just about two miles south of the lakeshore, south of Lake Michigan. And it's also on the Detroit to Chicago road. So while they were there, they might, they had overnight visitors sometimes. Several travelers have left accounts uh, in which they mentioned having stopped there and been helped to cross the river. Um, and one even mentions the prodigious number of fleas that there were in the barn <laughs> where they spent the night. Not always a pleasant uh, experience, I think. Um, and then uh, Bailey uh, lived here in what he called the Calumic. Uh, of course, you can you can hear his saying Calumet in Calumic, uh, what he what he said, uh, how the way in which he wrote it uh, until his death in 1835, and he is uh, buried in the cemetery that is on the Bailey homestead. Bailey was an independent trader. He was not affiliated with the Northwest Company or the American Fur Company, both of which were important organizations at Mackinac during this time. He uh, hired groups of voyageurs engagés to trade for him throughout Michigan, particularly in the Grand River area. Um, also in the Kankakee area down here, this is the Kankakee River running through Northwest Indiana and into Illinois. So this whole region would be the Kankakee area with Kalamick here. Um, he also, um, he had trading posts throughout Michigan, but um, also in the St. Joseph River, which we heard about on Monday evening. Uh, one of the places where there was an established trading post was at this place just north of what is today South Bend called Pach Avash um, Cow Park, where of course, uh, named after Buffalo who had, uh, had formerly been sighted in that place. And there's also a little um, excursion up to Grand Portage. This is the adventure with Dominique Rousseau that makes it up to that particular trading post up on Lake Superior. So based in Mackinac, working throughout this area of the upper Great Lakes. Um, the, um, this uh, Grand Portage adventure is, uh, you will see, uh, connected with a court case. Uh, which was, is involving his attempt to encroach on territory of uh, the Northwest Company. And uh, there was a little reaction to that that I'll talk about later. Another event in Bailey's life was, uh, he of course was a British subject. And during the War of 1812, he was uh, asked to recruit some natives uh, to fight on the side of the British against the Americans. Uh, the American forces uh, took umbrage at that. They captured Bailey and imprisoned him for a while, not too long, uh, but he was detained by them for a while uh, in, in 1813. Um, there seemed to be no hard feelings because he did become a U.S. citizen in 1817, which of course made it possible for him to continue his work as a fur trader. Uh, during his time living in Indiana, as I said before, his work in the fur trade continued, although on a much smaller scale. He had plans to develop some of his property into a town, which he called Bailey Town, uh, which did not materialize prior to his death, however. And I have Montreal on here. It's, of course, important because the trade goods that he received and the furs and sugar that he sent downriver were almost all sent to Montreal. Some went to Detroit, but most to Montreal. His broker or wholesaler, the person that he worked with a lot in Montreal is Toussaint Poutier, whose name you will hear again also. So what are the sources that can tell us about um, the fur trade business? I've told you about them, the ones that, that uh, the primary sources that, I've, that I have used uh, to um, prepare this talk. First of all, there is the volume that is owned by the Porter County Museum. Um, uh, this, it's this volume that starts in um, uh, 1799 and runs through spring of 1802. What you have here is a copy, uh, a, a photograph of the cover and then of the first page of that. Um, and you can see his little trademark, the bee in a diamond, um, the, the, the Bailey account trademark. There are 88 pages in this account book and they record financial transactions from day to day. We find records of what he bought and sold, both trade goods and supplies for himself and for his engagé, his employees, furs that he received, credit granted to various people, wages paid, etc. Um, and um, as I have said, it, it contains no personal information. There's nothing about family, uh, nothing about daily life, and really not even any family expenses that seem to be really recorded separately in this book. 
So a little a look at part of one of the pages. Um, I think you can see, hopefully you can see um, the, uh, this is the, the start of the page. You can see a list of things that he um, has purchased. Um, starting out with 435 pounds of sukha, of, of maple sugar. Uh, farther down, we have gunpowder and gun balls, uh, ammunition for, for the guns, butcher knives, a shirt, a piece of anzien, which is a kind of cloth, handkerchiefs, feather tufts, which are, of course, decorative items, a piece of colored ribbon, etc. These are This is the kind of, of um, variety of items that we we find, and we'll we'll see more of this a little bit later when we look more closely at one particular expedition. I wanted to spend a moment um, clarifying um, the currency that he uses for many of this. For many of you, I know this is review, not not anything that you don't know, but just in case it's not clear to some folks who are listening, he uses uh, the, the currency situation is pretty complicated. Uh, at that intersection of Canada and the United States. Bailey does not use dollars at all in this, uh, really in any of his, uh, of, of his account books. He does use two different currencies and you see them both here. One is pound sterling and that's right here where we have pounds, shilling and pence. But he also uses the old French system of livre, sol and denier and that's what you find out here uh, in, in this outer, um, uh, column, so this is 217 livres, whereas this is one pound, 17, pence, 17 uh, shillings and six pence. Um, he translates everything into livres, however. He does not, um, he, he notes things down in the pounds, shillings and pence, but then he translates it all into livres. And we can see that, oops, does not want to, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, on this second part of the page, I've just moved it down a little bit. Uh, you can see the items that he is purchasing here. But you see down at the bottom, he totals it. And then we have egal, and he puts it all into the livre, multi essentially multiplying it by 24. So 24 um, livre equals one pound sterling. Um, and um, You'll also notice that here he puts in um, a, a, a category called benefice, and that's um, more or less uh, what we might call the, um, the profit, uh, what people are, um, uh, what he or the person that he is trading with uh, are going to uh, see as, as the, uh, the difference in um, just the cost of the goods that are coming through and actually making some money on the transaction. Second um, set of um, work that uh, serve as a source for me is this, um, uh, the set of nearly 48 volumes of um, the works in the uh, Indiana State Library. And I've showed you uh, the covers of two of them here. Um, one of them showing the, again, here's the Bailey logo, sort of. And here is the Rousseau and Bailey partnership logo. We'll talk about more, that, uh, talk about that a bit more um, later. And then here is one of, just one of the pages um, in the, um, uh, of, of the kind that we see in the book that is in the uh, Porter County Museum as well as the, um, some of the account books that we see in the Indiana State Library connect, uh, collection. Um, also in the uh, collection of 48 volumes in the Indiana State Library collection, there's much more than just these simple account books, uh, these simple day books. We also have a different kind of account book. We also have um, what he calls books with brouillon or rough drafts, kind of a scratch volume where he writes things down prior to them being beautifully recopied into the final, uh, final volume. He also has um, what he calls factures, uh, which are invoices or order lists, and we'll take a look at some of those later. And very interestingly, there are a few sets of um, uh, recopied letters, not the letters themselves, but sort of drafts probably of letters. And we'll make use of some of those as well um, in, in finding out more about Bailey's uh, world. 
So um, what did he buy and sell? What did he trade? No big surprises here, but let's look at a little bit of detail. Um, on the left is a, a, um, a list, a very, very cursory and very partial list of the kinds of things that he bought and sold and then recorded in these account books. Obviously, the trade goods, and I'll talk more about those in a moment. Uh, there's alcohol, quite a few barrels of rum and bottles of rum, um, barrels and canvas, empty ones to uh, transport the goods that are being shipped back and forth in different directions. There are also supplies for his men and some uh, undoubtedly for himself, various kinds of tools, some food items, uh, clothing, uh, shirts and moccasins, um, and uh, breechcloths and leggings, items for the canoe to repair the canoe, the canoe itself, sails, um, uh, and, and uh, various fishing items too, things that are not surprising given life uh, on and near the water. There are also medicines, uh, various foodstuffs, and much more. We'll see a little bit more of that later. What I wanted to do uh, as I was looking through the, the volume that I've worked with most directly is I wanted to see what is the, in, in terms of the trade goods, what does he sell most of? And um, various scholars uh, have pointed out, as did Michael Nassani the other evening, pointed out to us that the most, um, most valuable uh, and the, the uh, highest total monetary value um, for in, within the fur trade throughout uh, the, the years was cloth and blankets. Um, and I, when I um, looked at trade goods, that was obviously a leading uh, category. It seemed to me on a sort of um, impressionistic basis that yes, indeed, it looked like there was a lot of cloth and a lot of blankets uh, that were being sold. But I realized as I looked with this single volume from the um, from the, the Porter County Museum, I couldn't really tell very well exactly what he was um, what he was buying, what he was selling. Were there any double entries, etc.? Um, so I turned to one of the other sources in the Bailey Papers, the uh, the Bailey Collection, and that was a list of what he called factures. And uh, that was a list of goods that were purchased from his wholesaler, Toussaint Poutier, in Montreal. Also, some of the factures are lists of goods that he's entrusting to his employees to trade. So two different kinds uh, of lists, very precise lists, and also all or nearly all trade goods of one kind or another. So I could sort of eliminate the other kinds of, of things. Um, for my own purposes, I grouped them into these six categories, um, cloth and blankets, argent, what he calls argenterie, so the, the sort of decorative items, brooches, earrings, uh, pins, um, um, various things like mirrors uh, and, and combs and that kind of thing. Then a category of major expenses were gunpowder, the gun balls, the lead, etc. Uh, another category was alcohol. Uh, another category, which was of some monetary significance, was large metal objects, kettles and pots, etc. And then finally, since three of these factures really are um, Bailey's expenses sending out men to do uh, wintering, to spend the winter and do the trading, um, he includes the salary or wages for these men and how much he spent on the equipment for them. So that was the sixth category that I did include. And here is what I found. Um, you can see the dates of these six documents. They are all um, summer and fall uh, of um, the year. I always want to say 2000. It's not. It's 1800. Um, and you can see that, not surprisingly, the highest percentage of monetary value is the cloth at 33% here. Second highest is uh, alcohol. Third highest is the gunpowder, etc then salaries and equipment when those are present, and uh, the argenterie or those sort of um, decorative trade goods really in terms of monetary value were, were pretty far down the list. So these are um, the three that are the lists of goods that went out are this one to André Charlebois, and then the, these last two, remember that name because we're gonna come back to André Charlebois in, in just a few minutes. 
So what's coming in? Uh, what kinds of furs is he bringing in? Um, and this is, uh, again, this is taken not from those, from the, the same volume with the factual, but in fact taken, it, taken from the single volume account book that's held by the Porter County, uh, Porter County Museum. And just really briefly, you can see the variety of animals. I think it's interesting to, to see this variety, knowing where he was trading. This is mostly going to be Michigan, a little bit the Kankakee area, but mostly Michigan. Um, you can also see um, that um, you can also see the average price per fur, um, and they varied a little bit. These are you can see the, the dates that these different groups of furs were registered, um, but and and this the the uh, price per fur varies a little bit, but not much, not significantly. And then you can see the total value and the total income from the furs of 60,000 livres. Of course, this is all uh, indicated in livres. So um, as we see, there is, I need to move a thing here, all right. A deer and dress skin, peau passé, or a skin that is partially prepared, uh, partially tanned, bear and bear cub, otter. Then there's an, an otter that, there's a word I can't read. <laughs> Um, and I put it in here because it's worth significantly less than the, the otter, uh, the regular otter. So uh, need to need to figure out what that is, but I did include it. We have Martin, lynx, fisher, pecan, mink, fox of several kinds, muskrat, raccoon, and then pounds of beaver. Uh, he does at some points uh, distinguish out qual skins that are not of, of quite as good quality. Um, but I also have just a sort of a summary. What's the most numerous? No surprise, deer. And I believe that that uh, the deer uh, uh, bones uh, were the most numerous at the St. Joseph, the Fort St. Joseph site as well. So no surprise that there are a lot of deer around. They're also eating my vegetable garden these days. Um, second most numerous is muskrat. Most valuable is the otter, and second is the bear. Deer is the total value is, is uh, the most valuable uh, skin is the deer. And second is the otter because each skin is worth so much. The beaver is fourth in total value. So clearly not at the top of the list for this time and place. The, the other thing that is being shipped down river or to Detroit is sugar, maple sugar. Um, uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, sorry, I skipped over this. This is, uh, for a couple of years, he or his clerk put together a wonderful um, sort of infographic of the kinds of furs that, uh, and quantities of furs that were shipped, and this would have been for the whole season. This is the year 1805. We don't have one for 1800 or 1801, but you can see a similar um, array of animals, similar kinds of prices, but uh, he did pretty well, 71,910 livres for just one season. And here we have then the maple sugar that is sent downstream. He has uh, quite a few records of um, impressive amounts, I think, of maple sugar. Um, 63 barrels, 19 coral, uh, quarter barrels of sugar, um, and the, for a total of 10,000 pounds, and at um, a half of a livre, 10 uh, sol per pound, that comes to about 5,000 livres, which I think is not an insignificant part of his income. So very briefly, with whom did he trade? Obviously, he traded with the natives, but they never appear in the particular account book that I have been working with. There are no mention of any of those trade partners. They are mentioned in some of the other volumes in uh, the, held in the Indiana State Library. And I'm gonna go very quickly just to show you that he does keep records of, uh, with names of people and uh, to some extent the furs that they are bringing in, although he doesn't always specify what kind of furs, and then uh, what items they are receiving in exchange for those furs. So here is some of this beautiful handwriting. Uh, the, the transcription and translation of this one is right here. 82 cats, of course, as you know, those are not cats. Those are chats sauvages or raccoons. Uh, but this is what he's getting from Langousset. Here's what he's getting from Mixalet. 
uh, from, I don't know if this is a real soldier or someone named Solda, I don't know, and this one is Lech. Uh, and then over here, we, you can see that he's indicating um, he has some, some tick marks here for one kind of fur and a, a, like a zero, a circle for another kind of fur. I don't know what those are. He uses that quite a bit, but I don't know um, what that is shorthand for. And here we can say for, um, uh, for the, uh, the native name Chavoine Binaisi, um, what he bought and how many of whatever skin it was that cost. So 10 of them for a barrel of rum, uh, three of them for a cloth blanket, for instance. So we do have some indication here, but uh, they are not otherwise identified. So um, I want to move on to talking about some of these opportunities and challenges that he had as an independent trader. And these are, they're, they're kind of stories, um, kind of narratives that grow out of um, mentions that we find in the, one, the single volume that I've really focused on and that are filled out quite considerably by the other information in the other volumes in the Indiana State Library. Um, the journal does open some little windows onto the ins and outs of the fur trade business as a business. In a couple of spots, he records that uh, how much he's had to spend to obtain a license to trade in this territory. Of course, he's British trading in, in the United States. We see that he needs to account for things like, uh, for instance, merchandise that is ruined when mon bateau est cassé, my boat is broken by a certain Captain Baker, and that was to the tune of 214 livres that Captain Baker needed to get to him somehow. Um, Bailey pays for people to convey letters to his business partners in Detroit or elsewhere. He pays for bread and biscuit to be baked. Um, he accounts for the salary and wages that he pays for the men who work for him, as well as the required equipment for him, and naturally the trade goods and other supplies for the aventure or trading expeditions. And in two cases, we see that he pays for une prise de corps, um, which is more or less an arrest. So he's arranging for somebody to be arrested. This is two different people. Uh, he's having to make those arrangements. Um, the account book does not register, that particular account book does not register just what they did to elicit this expense on Bailey's part, but I think we can get a hint um, along with understanding that the boat got broken, um, that not all goes smoothly in the world of the fur trade, and in fact, uh, we will discover it's a pretty cutthroat business, and multiple other accounts will make this clear. So let's look at one particular aventure, and this uh, text on the left that you see here shows up in the single volume that I've been working most closely with. It's dated 25th of August, 1800, and the heading is An Aventure, a Trading Expedition by André Charlebois, there's that name, for various merchandise by Invos in Folio 3, delivered to him on the date of this day to be converted for my account and risk. So I'm supplying him with 10,940 livres of goods that he and his men are to go out and trade, uh, spending the winter doing that trading. And luckily we have, in fact, that facture, here it is, it is in part of the Bailey collection in the Indiana State Library. It's about five and a half pages long, very detailed with the cost of all of these items. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, none of these items will be particularly surprising to, uh, to you folks. Uh, we see a whole variety of things that he is sending out with this group, fabric blankets, ribbon, feather tufts, vermilion, combs, peigne d'ivoire, uh, no doubt, um, buttons, scissors, rings, the decorative items, axes, basins, kettles, rum and high wine, grease, probably bear grease, uh, ink, paper, a scale, have to weigh out the gunpowder, for instance, uh, that one is selling tarps and canvas. There is a bark canoe mentioned here. Mirrors, needles, chocolate, tea, a candle mold, and a padlock, among many other items on these five and a half pages. Uh, 
Um, he also includes in here the wages. This is his total cost for this expedition, his wages that he's paying, as well as the equipment for the men. You can see that Charles Bois is the leader. And interesting to see um, these things that are specifically mentioned for them to some extent because the, he was required to equip them with some of these items. Um, quite a bit of tobacco, 18 pounds, six shirts. I'm not sure how that works out for four people, but there it is. Three bottles of rum, also not sure how that's gonna get divided out among four people. <laughs> uh, and six pounds of soap, which seems significant to me. So these are some of the things that we see in that uh, facture. What's interesting though, is that there is another piece of information that we gain about André Charlebois. Um, in among the drafts of letters. And this is a letter from Joseph Bailey to uh, Angus McIntosh, who was uh, a, uh, an important businessman in Detroit uh, with whom Bailey did uh, a fair amount of business. And in this letter, he talks about this trading post. And he says, um, I have a trading post which was heretofore led by a certain André Charlebois, who has spoiled and drunk three quarters of the drinks and a large part of the merchandise. He wasn't satisfied with drinking the rum he had himself, those three bottles, but went and opened a cache of three barrels of high wine, which was at the entrance to the said Masquegon, drank it and ruined the largest part of all that despite my orders. So not all is going smoothly. André Charlebois apparently was not to be trusted with just three bottles of rum. And what happens later in that letter, a little farther down on the page, we have this, mass this, uh, this passage. Um, I would like, sir, if it is not too much of an abuse of your good nature, that you would send me an arrest warrant for this gentleman to take him into custody at Mackinac upon his arrival. If you cannot send it to me on the present occasion, at least on the first boat. So please arrange that he will be taken into custody. Um, well, this is March 1st, 1801. Um, and I talked to you earlier about the two arrest warrants that, uh, that show up in Bailey's account book. Neither one of those is for André Charlebois. They're both for other people. So what's going on here? This is, this is the time period that is covered within the, the one account book, but it's not an expense that he mentions. So what's going on with that? Well, we find out, um, in fact, that in July, he receives the furs from this particular aventure. The label is Aventure par uh, uh, André Charlebois. So uh, this is recorded in the one volume of the account book that I've looked at. So a standard amount of, of furs that one might expect. So what's up with all of this? Well, if we read a little bit further in the, um, in the uh, letter book, we come across another letter um, also to Macintosh in which he says, thank you for the trouble that I've asked you to take for me, um, the subject, of the name Charles Le Bois, about a whom I spoke to you in my last letter, I have taken the route of making an amicable arrangement with him, an arrangement à l'amiable. So apparently he did not go through with the arrest warrant. They worked it out. I haven't found um, any places uh, where there are sums of money that might obviously be the arrangement that he worked out, an arrangement that he worked out with Charles Bois, but it's interesting to know that this is how that little um, contretemps resolved itself. One imagines it is not the only time that that kind of thing happened with an aventure. So the second one that I want to talk to you about and finish up with this evening has to do with uh, Dominique Rousseau, uh, a second story. And I mentioned uh, Dominique Rousseau to you before and the fact that, um, that Bailey formed a partnership with him. Um, there are a number of partnerships that are indicated just in the one volume, those two years um, that uh, uh, that uh, that one volume covers, he formed partnerships with a number of people. Hey, let's let's pool our money, purchase trade goods, 
send out an aventure and then we'll share the profits from the first. So that, that is not infrequent. But this is a particularly important one and particularly known because of that court case that I told you about before. Um, Dominique Rousseau was a well-known uh, Montreal and in fact Mackinac uh, businessman, um, about 20 years older than Bailey as it happens. And um, you can see his mark and within uh, the, the account books, we have Rousseau and Bailey's mark. So this was, this was a thing um, for, for Bailey. This was a serious partnership that he was putting together with uh, Dominique Rousseau. So the lawsuit, very, very briefly, um, and some of you are probably familiar with this, the Aventure, which was led by a man named Paul Hervieux, went up to Grand Portage in the summer of 1802. When he arrived there, he was harassed by an employee of the Northwest Fur Company who did not want to have their territory impinged upon um, by these, this upstart. He slashed the tent of Hervieux, he threw the goods all over the place, he insulted him, which was also a very bad thing. Um, and the upshot of all of that was that um, Rousseau and Bailey filed suit uh, in Montreal, the Court of the King's Bench. Uh, they filed suit against Duncan McGillivray. And it's an interesting case in that we have um, the transcription of all of the testimony of all of the witnesses who said, yes, I saw this episode and here's what happened. And that you probably are familiar with, there's an article written by Grace uh, Newt uh, published in 1940. Uh, that describes that and that gives the transcriptions of those documents. Rousseau and Bailey came out on the winning end. Uh, there was a fine of 500 pounds that was levied and that case was resolved in April of 1804. So a little backstory to this, but um, I discovered that in fact, there is a letter in which uh, Bailey proposes the start of this partnership. And it's among, it's in that same uh, book of drafts of letters in which the André Charlebois letter, letters uh, occurred. And he says, the present letter is to make proposals to you related to what I heard you say at Michelin Mackinac last summer. Several times it happened that in my presence you said you found the post, I'm not sure which one, very advantageous, but as for you, the fatigue of the voyage was too unpleasant for you to be able to return. But if you found a young man who had enough talent to occupy this place that you could furnish merchandise at a very great advantage, therefore I propose myself to be your associate as long as you found me capable of filling this position. And of course, Bailey at this time was in his mid-twenties, so he certainly was a younger man than Rousseau. Um, one hiccup in this was that what Bailey was proposing then was that Rousseau would be the, uh, the person in Montreal who would purchase the merchandise, get it to Mackinac, and then it would get sent out. And that meant that, um, he, that, that Bailey would be sort of abandoning the person with whom he had been working for a number of years, Toussaint Poutier. And this is, I think, a kind of an interesting passage. I've not requested any mer merchandise from Monsieur Poutier for next year, and therefore I am free. I am not leaving him for having treated me badly, for he has served me not like family, because with family we eat each other up, but like a true friend. I am leaving him with regret. But I hope that he will perceive that there is nothing dishonorable in this affair and that he will not resent me because I have no other reason to make the change than I'm sick of paying the prices that one pays at Michelin Mackinac. So purely financial reasons and he hopes that Potier won't take it the wrong way. I take a couple of things from this um, passage. First of all, it's an interesting characterization of family. Um, I don't know what he might be referring to, but apparently some family relationships got a little snippy at some point. Um, but also he does feel a bit guilty about leaving Poutier, and it seems to be a, a question of honor as much as business. So honor and business uh, go together here. Also, he is a through and through businessman. He's hoping to get a better deal, to get the goods at a cheaper price so that he can make more money off the deal. That's clear. Um, and he does, in fact, send uh, separately to Rousseau uh, a memoir, a list of all of the things that he is proposing that they purchase. 
And don't worry, he does later on get back together with Toussaint Poitier and does work with him uh, throughout for many years to come. So all is not lost in terms of that relationship. So there is um, what I have to say about Joseph Bailey and uh, his business, his fur trade business, the relationships, the, uh, the, uh, the hiccups that came, the sort of rough and tumble world that, that, uh, that there was. I think we have these little kernels of items that come out in the one account book. And by working with the further sources of information, we can really fill out uh, and get a, a, a much more complete view of what the fur trade was like, at least from the point of view of Joseph Bailey. There's more work that I want to do that I, I would like to, to undertake. Um, I'd like to see what's going on with his native trade partners. I'd like to see what happens to the Rousseau partnership. I don't know how long that lasted. And I'd like to do much more work on the later part of his life, the time that he spent at Kalamick. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to um, take any questions that you might have. Randa, thanks so much. Uh, this is such a fascinating topic and I can only imagine uh, uh, the work that goes into reading through uh, these journaux and, uh, and uh, discovering uh, all the intricacies of, of Daily's business affairs. Uh, there's an interesting exchange in um, uh, the chat about mm -hmm. uh, maple sugar, maple syrup. You mentioned, uh, I believe, and I saw the word sucre. So it was actually maple sugar and not syrup that was being sugar. traded. It's, mm -hmm. so the question came, now this was being shipped, was this coming from Montreal and being shipped out or vice versa? It was being shipped to Montreal and to Detroit. Okay. So this was in the same way the furs came out of the hinterlands. So the maple sugar came out of the hinterlands, sometimes packaged in barrels and sometimes packaged in those birch bark containers known, known as mukuk. Um, and uh, he, he records both of them, both of them. And they're quite fantastic amounts of sugar um, that seem to be bringing in uh, good income for him. I, I don't know a lot more about that, but that's just what I've observed. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll, a let, of yeah, I'll let you go ahead and, and uh, ask those questions. Sure. Uh, uh, no mention of bison or buffalo skin. No, I think that at this point, at least he was not um, there weren't very many uh, bison still running around in, in, in Michigan in this area. There were much, many fewer of them. I think that was much, there were more of them still much farther west. And at this point, he wasn't really doing much trade very far west, a little foray or two into the Illinois country, le pays des Illinois, as he calls it, but um, very little. And no, there are no uh, bison hides at all in this particular volume. And really throughout, I've not taken a good look, but I've not seen many um, uh, hides, uh, bison hides at all. And a uh, question from Mark Barbeau. Did you find any mention that the livre or pound exchange rate changed over the years? Have you done enough work to see, did prices change or the currency change at all? I have been really focusing on just this short period of time, so I haven't seen that. It's also um, fairly confusing, um, and at some points he does turn to dollars very late. Um, I've not seen, I, I, my impression is that it, that it stayed pretty constant, the ratio of pound sterling to leave stay pretty constant. I would need to do some research to see if the prices of furs stayed constant over the years. I've really just looked at that one, um, that one relatively short time period. So I'm not sure about the value of the furs, but it's a really good question and really something, I'll put it on my list of things to look at because it's a, it's a good point. There was a question about the, the piquant, but that's a, you said it's a fisher, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a, a large, apparently they, they still um, exist. I've seen um, conversations among people online in, in Quebec saying, oh yeah, that pecan was in my yard and I can't keep, let my cat outside because it's dangerous. So 
uh, the fisher is is still uh, is still there, and I think also still living in northern Michigan as well. And a comment from Patrick uh, about uh, saying that it, it reminds him of another trader on Madeline Island in Lake Superior. Uh, he can't remember his name though, who was also married to a Native American woman. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm right. sure there were many. There were many. And in fact, uh, Bailey had a number of children um, who did different things. The one Alexis went to Minnesota. I don't think he was based on Madeline Island, but but was up in more in that area towards Lake Superior. So um, there, there could be family, but certainly many, many of the French traders before uh, Bailey and after Bailey were married to, to women of native uh, heritage, absolutely. And that was one of the uh, questions was, uh, what was the nationality of his first and second wife, which you did uh, right. allude to, I believe. Right, they were both um, mixed, of mixed heritage and on their mother's side, both Odawa. And thanks to Lynn Evans, for who's, who knows the area, who says there's still Fisher in northern Michigan. Thank you. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone asked if I'm sure of the spelling of Vissier. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> That's the best that I've been able to make it out. Uh, if someone has ideas, I would be grateful. Um, there is one other word. If I can, if I can um, indulge the sort of crowdsourcing with experts that I've got here, there is one word I have never been able to figure out. And since um, there were some folks who who were able to help Peter out last night, maybe I'll I will type it in here. It's a kind of knife, and I have looked and looked at the the word um, as often as I can, and it looks like it is masquine or perhaps masquine, couteau masquine. It shows up numerous times. I swear it's a K in the middle of it, and I have not been able to find what it might be. He has uh, couteau à cartouche. He said he has couteau boucheron, many different kinds of knives, and there's this one. So if anyone has any brainstorms and understands what that is, I would be grateful. He writes, mas, not, not, it corrected couteau de Cousteau, sorry. <laughs> it's not Cousteau, it's couteau with two Ts. That's how he spells it. <laughs> if you can see that in the chat, it is not Cousteau. And I will check on that spelling of Rissier if, if uh, Michael McCafferty has an idea of what it might be, um, that would be great. It's clearly some kind of, of otter pelt that is of lesser quality. It doesn't quite look like vieux, but not, not positive what that might be. Okay, Misty, thank you. All right, ah, perhaps a knife, a serrated knife, who knows? Um, the closest word that I've, I've come to it is, is uh, sort of translation of putty knife, but it does not seem likely that it would be a, a putty knife. So thanks, thanks Misty, for, for letting me know that uh, even, even experts have not perhaps run across this word. Well, it will just re remain masquine then, some kind of knife. <laughs> Do you think? Do we think that's a French word, or it, it, obviously he's writing in French? But for him to use a K, yeah, would be right. unusual. It would be unusual. He um, spelling is creative. Um, yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> as you can see from the Peigne d'Ivoire, with an H at the beginning of Ivoire. So um, it is. It's certainly a K that I have have determined. The letters around it, I think, are an S and not an R. But um, I've, I've, I've tried to think of what possibilities might be, and it's just remaining. Well, we, a question. we all have we all have a homework assignment now. There you maybe go. maybe on Saturday back. somebody will come back with a with an answer. Uh, that would be that great. Question. I would be I would be terrifically <laughs> grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, if there are not any other uh, questions, uh, we are nearly at eight o'clock. Uh, I would like to thank Randa once again for a fascinating uh, presentation. 
And remind everybody, we will uh, be regrouping on uh, Saturday afternoon, and I will be sending the Zoom link for those two presentations uh, sometime on Saturday morning. And I certainly hope to see you then. And uh, good evening and bonne soirée. Merci, bonne soirée à tous.